How's it going, everybody? Thank you for being here. My name is Antonio, and you're about to watch or listen to a conversation that is general and impersonal in nature, one that will include a lot of forward-looking statements and uh, speculations about future events that may or may not take place, but also one that will include or that will rather not include any financial nor investment advice whatsoever, uh, no professional advice of any sorts. So please proceed with caution and do more research before trusting talking heads on the internet, right? That all said, uh, Matthias and, and Simon, thank you for uh, being here today, gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Pleasure is all mine, of course. Um, I'm looking forward to this conversation because we, you, you know, uh, Matthias, you and I met in Zurich uh, a few months back. Um, but the audience did, didn't, re you know, didn't really get that pleasure to do that. So I guess obligatory first question here. Who are you guys and why do you think, uh, what do you think you're worth listening to? Yes, we are Talk um, Capital Management based in Zurich. Simon and I set up the company two years ago to invest what we will think is a commodity decade, let's say. We believe that we entering a, are entering a new super cycle which will last for the next 10 years. And therefore, we decided to basically set up two funds. One is precious metals focused, so it's mostly gold and silver. And the topic of our conversation today, battery metals focused, this is the second one, which also includes a, a strong component of uranium as well. Okay. What, what, it's a, you started it up two years ago. It's just the two of you that do this? Yes, that's just the two of us. Yeah. Okay. How, how have the last two years been? I, I reckon you, you got a nice start, but then it's sort of been... <laughs> uh, I mean, yes. I don't know. Tell me, what's your P&L? Yeah, it's exactly as you said. We had a nice start with both funds. We started Precious Metals one uh, in April last year, April 21. A uh, good run into summer and then the difficult time started. And uh, they're still ongoing, as you know. And the second fund, the Energy Revolution Fund, um, started in October last year. So it's now the 13th month. Uh, same story here. Good start into the first quarter of the year. Um, also beginning after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And since then, it's stalling more or less. But in the Energy Fund, which is the topic here today, we are flattish uh, across the year, depending on the share class and the underlying currency. Mm. Hmm. Well, I guess flat flat is better than what my portfolio is doing. Uh, what is your um? What what is sort of your your outlook on those two on on those two funds? Like, do, do you have an idea of when you want to start returning money to shareholders, or is this something that you want to do in perpetuity? Um, as as Matthias said at the beginning, uh, we think it's going to be a commodity decade. So. Um, our horizon for, for the company and those two funds is, is rather towards the end of this decade. So that, that's a late 2020s, early 2030s. So we haven't had any, any proper thought about when to start returning. We're really just ramping everything up. Okay. Okay. Let's do talk about those, uh, battery metals then. Um, I know far too little besides that, you know, the lithium price looks like it's, um, it, it, you mentioned uranium, so the lithium price chart looks like what I had hoped or imagined that the uranium price chart would look by now, but it, it, it it's not yet, or maybe, you know, who knows. Um, I guess you'll tell me more about that here in a second, but first, wouldn't you maybe give me sort of the elevator pitch on on why battery metals in general and, and why now? Yeah, I mean... We started thinking about the topic about one and a half years ago. And, and, um, first, first thing we have seen is that commodities in general have been pretty cheap compared to other asset classes. I mean, you might have seen the same for uranium. Um, it went for commodities in general. And then second thought was, okay, which commodities, what exactly? And um, are there any trends appearing, um, for that gonna last? let's say five to 10 years. And it was pretty obvious then, especially in Europe and Switzerland, that the politicians and uh, the people are really pressing for for uh, renewable energies, decarbonization of, of uh, energy and mo mo mobility. So 
um, the whole switch from from uh, fossil fuel cars, combustion engines to electric vehicle was pretty obvious, and and we thought, okay, independent of any anything what happens in the world and 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 uh, uh, consumption up and down uh, and economic cycles going forth and back, but the push into into electricity um, is going to happen, and therefore we identified battery metals to be the part of the commodities to be into. Just because of the t- tailwind you got from from politics. Okay, and when when you mention battery metals, what's uh, what exactly is that? I mean, I obviously I know uh, nickel, cobalt, lithium, and uh, what manganese. Simply because I know the LFP battery, uh, which I had a bad experience with, and also the uh, NMC batteries. Uh, but w- w- is is that pretty much what you're focusing on, or are you adding other stuff like uh, what do you have? Graphite, graphene. You have silicon and other stuff, or what do you focus on? Um, we drilled that down to, let's say, four battery metals, which are nickel, copper, graphite, and lithium. Mm-hmm. Okay. Those four are, are the focus. Yes. Okay. W- which one of those do you like the, the most? Like, if you, you know, if you had to pick your favorite child. Yeah, that's difficult to say. It depends on 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 what what parameters you're looking at. I mean, lithium is for sure the most interesting one just because of the price development of the of the metal itself, right? Um, graphite is pretty interesting, less because of the metal, but rather because of the technology involved. Um, copper is one of the most used metals on Earth uh, overall. So it's more influenced by other factors than from, from the battery demand. Um, yeah, so it depends. We we don't have any any most liked metals. We try to earn money with all of them. Yeah, sure. I mean, your your most liked metal is the one that makes you the most the most money. I guess. Yeah, exactly. What do you? Uh, but is it like? Is it an even split that you have between these? Um, I mean, how how do you determine what to what to buy? Do you, did you start out and saying like, okay, we're gonna do twenty five percent each, or do you just look for companies and do whatever makes sense? Um. No, it was a different approach. Um, first of all, maybe uh, important to know for, for the listeners and to the viewers, that we are not investing directly in the metals, but rather in exploration and development companies. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that alone narrows down a little bit uh, your investment scope. So they're not equally enough investable companies around uh, on, on the various metals. And then we try to to time the cycles a bit. So we might re- you might remember we have seen nickel going bollocks uh, at the beginning of this year, more caused by some uh, um, specific issues. Um, lithium is now having a good run. Graphite might have a good run later. Copper is a totally different story. So we try to to time those cycles with some various uh, quantitative models, and and then overweight or underweight the respective companies. Hmm. That's a yeah. That's pretty much the you know make sense approach. Um, it, it's not like you, you didn't do it. Um, just twenty five, twenty five, and then and then start splitting it because I know some people would make a framework and then start plugging companies in the framework. Uh, that's just a one one approach that I've heard about. Um, lithium. I agree with you. Lithium is sort of the most interesting uh, of those specifically because of that spike, and I guess not many people expected that to happen. Uh, it, it has ran what over two hundred percent is what I've written down year over year, um, and and funnily enough, I've been talking about this a couple of weeks now. But the the only commodity that's outperformed lithium year over year are are uh, eggs in the United States. Like you know, just I guess there was, there was I guess there was some um, influenza problem, or whatever. They had to kill a lot of chickens, so eggs spiked up like two fifty percent. But so lithium, why did that happen? Like why why did it have to go uh, go up three times two hundred percent? Yeah, always difficult to say why something happens or why, why not. Um, at the end, it's it's a huge demand out of China, um, especially also for for electric vehicles. Um, yeah, the thing is, I I stopped. I mean, I have a trading background. I, I traded uh, for an investment bank for more than a decade before before we started here. Um, I stopped thinking about why something happens exactly, because the danger is most of the time 
you you find some reason uh, in hindsight and that doesn't help you in, in, in finding the next opportunity. So we try to time markets or to, to detect when markets start to pick up something and then have a set of, of, of good companies where we are willing to invest when you think the time is right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I can't explain you why, especially lithium is now going through the roof and not some of the other metals like copper, for example, which is stolen for quite some time. Yeah. Uh, I, I tend to agree with you. What I am sort of looking for is to understand, was this a, a demand issue or a, a, or a supply issue? Like, for example, what happened with, with uranium in 2007, why it went up was it was not necessarily a demand issue. Like there was not a surge of demand, but there was a, a flooding of one of the largest mines and then it was a, a perceived um, supply issue. So I was I was wondering if if maybe that happened in in lithium. Like, was there was there a miner going going under or something else that was a supply side problem? I agree with you. Sometimes there are events that that cause price to to rip higher massively, but in lithium, not that we are aware of. Mm -hmm. So it's really just um, supply demand gap uh, gap, and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's a constant demand. I mean, it it has stalled a little bit during the summer. Uh, now the leasing price for about one, two months now is, is, is creeping up higher again. So it seems like a constant process, a constant high demand and not some special events. Hmm. Would that mean that the price is, the, 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 the level at which the price is right now, does that mean that that's maybe more sustainable? Because what happened in, in, in 2007 with uranium that I'm using here as an example, because it's pretty much the only market that I know the history of is like it had a spike and they came down up pretty quickly. Um, is that going to be the thing with lithium? Like, well, what are you expecting? Is this more more of a sustainable price level? It looks more sustainable. It, at least it is now for a couple of months or for the whole year now. But when you take into consideration the the current market price and the the production price, the difference is quite high. So what we're going to see is now, first of all, all, all the active producers are, are really earning uh, tons of money, which is nice for them and, and their shareholders, of course. Um, but you also see a lot of projects pushing forward um, and trying to come to, into production as soon as possible to also profit from that cycle. And as you know, for, from all commodity cycles, as soon as supply is picking up meaningfully, um, price will, will go back to, to the, towards the production. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say it, it looks stable from a demand side. So there is pressure on lithium price. There's a lot of demand. Uh, there are not so many um, good projects. So let's say large supplier, uh, large supply available. But over time, I expect the price to not outperform, let's say, other battery metals going forward. Right. Just because the imbalances are, are different on, on, the, on the different metals. Is it? hard to put lithium projects into production i mean if, if you had to you know put it on a scale of uh, let's say something that's i mean nothing's really easy to put into production but uranium mines for example are necessarily harder to put into production like would you would you say it's easier or harder to bring on new supply i would say it's generally it's not let's say an easy project to do because I mean, as you know, if you look at Europe, the history with lithium projects is always, as you know, quite difficult and, and everybody's happy if it's not happening in Europe, right? Mm. So, so from therefore the environmental impact, especially is, is a tough one, which I think will become harder and harder over the next couple of years, mm. especially the ones that are water intensive. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's sort of, that's us, I guess, Europeans. We we like to have the advantages of everything, but the disadvantages of nothing. That's sort of that's how we are. Uh, isn't everybody right? Is this yeah. is this thesis on battery metals? Is it is it completely dependent on the on the projected growth in in demand for electric vehicles? I mean, does your does your thesis fall apart if there is say ten or twenty percent less growth than what is what is projected today over the next decade? No, I don't think so. Because the the underinvestment over the last decade in, in metals in general was was pretty heavy. So there wasn't much going on. 
if you see that it's getting harder and harder to permit new mines, especially also in countries where I would say a lot of people were counting on, let's say Chile for copper or also lithium in South America. So I would say it's it's getting harder and harder to get the metals. And and I mean also it's the battery metals is also a storage a storage question, right? A storage topic. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the discussions we have right now in, in Europe how to to store energy, uh this the batteries are a big topic, especially for solar and wind, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. So it's it's more of a supply thing. Just we're lacking the current supply uh, yes. as, as opposed to the projected growth. Yeah, I, I would say so, yeah. What, what it, is, like, what what else is that thesis the, the dependent on, though? Is it, like, I guess China is a big player in this market because a lot of demand comes from there. Uh, but what, what else? I mean, again, the, those two factors. Uh, as long as people want to decarbonize, and that's politically supported or driven, and and whole Europe is is, is uh, strongly marching in that direction, or even more now with the energy crisis, and the thesis holds up. Um, I think I'm not wrong when I'm when I'm saying that we might not end up with producing so many electric vehicles than than some people uh, expect expect us, mm-hmm. and that the whole uh, decarbonization. Of, of of mobility will have some delays, but at the end, that's going to rather be because of the of the supply constraints on the metals and not on let's say less political will or or, or, or such, such things. So, and if if the problem with this, with moving forward is really on on the supply side, then prices will stay high uh, anyway. Mm. And then, and, and uh, Matthias mentioned already, there's a second thing now popping up uh, massively since, since let's say, the, the Ukraine war started. People are really thinking of getting renewable energies um, themselves. I mean, even I personally ordered my solar um, thing on, on my on my roof. Um have to wait now for another couple of months until it gets delivered and installed. But... But if a lot of people doing that and, and I want to have a battery, uh, otherwise it doesn't make any sense. So the demand for batteries seems to be quite high. Hmm. What about innovation in the space, though? I mean, it seems it seems to me like, actually, I just recently yesterday, I no, the day before yesterday, I spoke to Joe Mazumder from Exploration Insights, and he, he planted this uh, a, a, a thought seed in, in my head as he said that he, he doesn't like like he's not attracted to investments uh, in things that can be innovated away. I guess that's sort of how he put it. So, why would you? What would you go for? Um, for like cobalt and nickel, for example, um, where like you, you have a push towards LFP batteries, for example, that that get rid of the you know N- N- NMC batteries pretty much, and um, that's sort of the, the 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 thought that I've been having about those battery metals is like can. All of them be innovated away. I mean, we saw, you know, less demand, I guess, than expected for nickel or something along those lines because of that sort of switch to LFP batteries. I'm, I'm a little shady there in the details, but um, what I'm what I'm thinking about is like stuff like graphene, for example. I brought it up at the beginning. Uh, I've been following the market for a couple of years now. Nothing meaningful has happened yet. I mean, just the little developments. But how do you look at innovation when it comes down to those uh, four metals that you told me about: nickel, cobalt, lithium? and graphite. I would say the, the thing with technical innovation is, is usually that people overestimate how fast it goes. It takes way longer than people expect. So if, if we look at the next five to 10 years, I, I don't expect a big shift, to be honest. Mm. Because with each change you do, there's also all the processes attached to it, right? If you if you change the battery in a, in a car, you also have to change some things around, right? So everybody has that is invested in the kind of the legacy technology will have, let's say, some, uh, you as an accountant know this, right? Depreciation on everything. So they will be hard and tough to, to kick it out after three years, right? Mm. Mm. Only mm. If, if there's really something that, that makes it so expensive that there's a hard pressing need to do it. Right. 
Right, 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 so right. I, I wouldn't underestimate the stickiness of old technology, right? Mm. I mean, you see it especially. I think the the biggest thing that's currently going on is that people want to get rid of cobalt because of the, the politi- political, let's say, issues mm. attached to where the origin is, right? So I think that has highest priority. Mm. Right, right. I also, um, well, I guess I... I guess this is, you know, uh, I guess ba- battery metals are dependent. What, what you're also telling me is the battery metals are, are dependent on on the batteries market, which, you know, it sounds pretty straightforward, but they're not necessarily as dependent on EVs. Like it, it's batteries specifically, not batteries for EVs. Yes, That's sort of the I, picture that I'm getting here yes, from. Yeah. Yes, I, I would really look at it this way. We also made a series of articles last year where we looked at different ways to electrify society you know with planes with with chips and everything right how how realistic is that we have electronic driven chips right so it's it's really something it's it's a broader topic it's it's not really as narrow as the vehicles Hmm. that's a good point i guess a lot of people would look at it from from a different perspective and that's specifically the demand side what's been happening on the supply side is also interesting uh, specifically what's been happening in Indonesia just uh, last week or something like that, I, I read a few um, headlines about in- Indonesia looking to maybe uh, ban the exports of tin. And through reading that, I figured out that Indonesia had already banned the um, exports of nickel, I guess. And they were one of the lar- largest uh, producers uh, in the world. And they are now, I guess I read this this week or must have been late last week, something along those lines. There were rumors going around about about them uh, creating a new uh, OPEC style cartel, but then for battery metals. Um, what's, the, what's the probability of that happening? And uh, what effect do you think that might have on, on the battery metals market? I mean, difficult to judge, but in my point of view, uh, it's pretty Im- improbable. Because as soon as they try to invent that, they need the support from, let's say, the largest powers on the planet. It's not like OPEC. OPEC had the support from the U.S. back then to to get it up and running and then bring some kind of stability into the oil market, right? Um, that's not going to happen here. I mean, I, I see I see why they're going to try it, but it it will be. F- fight against and, and the, I, I don't see them succeed so so you, you don't think there's going to be like a, a a material effect in any ways like this is more of a news story than it is a, a financial story yes i guess but what we're going to see is, is the, the bifurcation of, of, of the market uh overall i mean the whole tensions between let's say the west uh, led by the u.s and 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 other regions, uh, Russian, one thing, uh, but, but China, China and, and, and uh, some Asian allies on, on the other hand, that's gonna, that's gonna have a huge impact. And, and I guess we're gonna see a couple of commodities where, where we're not gonna have a, a unified global market mm. for this commodity, but rather some different markets with different pricing on it. I mean, uranium could become one. Uh, I'm sure you have talked and, and read about that. But this could happen to other metals as well. Mm-hmm. So that's a possibility, of course. And then if, if one block is not willing to trade or, or sell those metals uh, to the other block, um, yeah, that's going to have an impact for sure. Mm-hmm. Right, right. There's also uh, something comparable in copper where the uh, above ground reserves uh, of copper in China are drying up. In Shanghai, there's big warehouses, uh, apparently very famous warehouses. I just learned about them last week. And um, in the article that I learned about them from, they were talking about getting the copper um, in in the right hands at the right time. So that's also a, like, it's not only um, secondary and primary supply versus uh, versus demand. That's not the whole market. Like, there's also the logistics of the market uh, who wants to sell? Who doesn't want to sell? When do they want to? When can they export it? And and the the transportation, the logistics of it are also important for the price. So, where do like is there, is there one spot besides Indonesia where most of the battery metals come from? Like where does where does lithium come from? Lithium is is not so bad diversified, but where we could see an issue is graphite. 
Mm. In graphite, 90% is coming out of China. Um, and that's exactly one of the markets where we could see some kind of, let's say, retaliation uh, from China towards the West, uh, maybe for, for now the, the whole story going on in the chip sector, right? Where, where the US tries to ban the export of chip technology to China. Um, graphite could be one of the methods where, where China could react massively um, towards the West. Mm. It, I'm happy that you're mentioning the U.S. because there's, there's been a focus uh, over there of them. You know, they want they want to bring bring back domestic production of of whatever they could. And it was this uh, recent news that came from from Biden's office uh, where he announced uh, what is it, two point eight billion dollars? If I got this correctly, mm-hmm. so in subsidies for domestic battery um, material producers in other industries that that c- c- couldn't that put a a drag. Maybe on the price is it you know that 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 I mean that's a subsidy that's aiming at increasing the production capacity, or is that more of a time thing? To be honest, in in our view, it's rather politics ahead of the midterm elections mm-hmm. than having a real impact on on the market or let's say the metals, the availability and the price of the metals. Um, yeah, for sure, a couple of companies will will profit of that, uh, but we all know it's it's let's say. Cantillon effect. So those that are closest to the government will profit most and, and some of the money uh, might end up with smaller producers or small companies. But I don't see a huge impact on the price front. I mean, to be honest, if, if you really want to, to add supply, domestic supply, and you want to, to let's say, have lower prices, uh, you should rather do proper energy politics than just pouring out money out of the window. I mean, it's pretty similar to the oil to the oil story right now. I mean, Biden pledging for cheaper oil, putting pressure on to oil companies for for having too high margins and too high profits, mm-hmm. but on the other hand, not allowing a pipeline to be built, not allowing um, um, fracking or not, not leasing enough uh, enough land for domestic oil production. So it's rather politics than than real real uh, measures. Yeah. That's what I figured out too, because it's um, I mean the the big problems really with with domestic production in the in in Northern America has been uh, in North America has been the the red tape around building those uh building those mines. So instead of uh, you know doing something um to to speed up the the licensing process or permitting process stuff like that, they just you know they just stick a big number a big headline number that's going to take everybody's attention on the news. But that doesn't really do anything. That's sort of my conclusion too. So I'm happy that you're you're uh, saying that as well. Besides that, is there is there something like a catalyst or something that um, maybe in the near term or whenever that you think could could make bat- battery metals? Uh, and 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 I'm I'm focusing in on lithium here specifically, but that sort of can make it do that next leg up because what happened is sort of you know it had that run up and then as you mentioned the, the price has been stable. But is, is there any unanswered directional question that that needs to be answered for us to to see a move one way or another normally you only see that large moves or jumps in the price you see when something on the supply side goes wrong i guess right now the risk is rather on the downside for the price it's just because of the uncertainty about the economic development in general, I mean, that's the main reason in our view why copper is not trading higher. And a lot of stories and talks about copper shortages and only, uh, as I said, only four days of, of, of demand on ground or in warehouses. But people are fearing that a lot of, of big economies go into recession the next couple of months. Um, so prices are rather uh, supposed to come lower because of that. Doesn't need to happen, especially not on, on specific metals. But unless we're going to see something big happening as an accident or, or something like that, I don't see a, a huge spike in in prices. Mm. Is that because you mentioned slowing down economic growth? Is that sort of the the biggest risk for your for your guys' thesis? Because like, do do you have a do you have a Fukushima? 
for the battery metals market? Like what happened? Fukushima you know, totally crushed the uranium market back then. Do you have something like that in, in, the, in the battery metals market? I don't expect it. I mean, what we have seen, for example, in China now, I mean, China has the weakest growth this year uh, they had for, for a long time. And despite that, the sales of, of, of electric vehicles surged by 80, 83% this year. And the demand for lithium and battery metals in general out of China increased uh, despite the economic weakness. So our expectation is that the underlying trend for the decarbonization of, of mobility is much stronger and larger than the, the cyclical up and down, downs of, of economies. Hmm. With that in mind, I guess it's kind of funny for three Europeans to use a, a baseball metaphor. But if we if we assume that this cycle will go the full nine innings here, what inning of of the battery metals uh, cycle do you think we're in now? I would say some somewhere in in the in the first third, so maybe second or third. I mean, people are now waking up to supply issues in the metal space. Um, especially because the whole energy crisis made them more aware of. Um, people realize there are going to be uh, shortages in, in the decade ahead, but the shortages are not yet real, or not really real. Right? I mean, there are, it seems obvious in lithium because the, that's why the price is, is creeping higher constantly. But a real shortage where, where producers have to stop production because they can't, can't get hold on, on any material, uh, didn't happen yet, so mm. I think we're still at, still at the start of, of the whole cycle. Right, right. That's one way of putting it. There's also, I mean, it could be that that if this actually becomes a super cycle, decade or multi decade super cycle in commodities, uh, that sort of be the the tournament. So we might even be, you know, in the first cycle of the first game, but then you know the first game is sort of resource or, or commodity minded people find out about these commodities. They have to jump in and go through the cycle, and then sort of the next cycle is is another leg up, which is the volatile as well. But you go through innings and stuff like that, where other people and funds come in, and then towards the end of the super cycle, you have you, you know we have the the, the um, generalist investors coming in, which, from my personal experience in real life, absolutely nobody's thinking about any metals. I don't know what you guys have experienced, but if I ever mention to somebody that I'm in mining. The very first thing they ask is like, oh, Bitcoin mining? I don't know, like actual <laughs> mining. And, and some people are even surprised that that still happens because we, we don't have any of that uh, around us in Belgium. So there's uh, there's that. Um, yeah, I'm um, I'm sort of thinking how, how to take this further. What, what um, b Besides those, four, maybe talk about what else you, you sort of have in your portfolio because I know that you, you don't have too much time here, so you almost got to run. Um, but what, what other metals... Because you mentioned copper, you mentioned uranium. What other metals do you have in your um, in your not precious metals fund? Yeah, it's graphite um, and nickel and lithium. Okay, so that's it. So copper, copper uranium, graphite, graphite uh, nickel, cobalt, and lithium. Not cobalt. No. Not cobalt. Okay, yeah. I got that wrong. Okay, it. Let me. I like asking this question. I call it the gun to your head uh, scenario question. <laughs> if you could only keep exposure to one metal, and that's starting tomorrow or today, the market's still open in the US. So, um, starting today, you can only hold one of those metals that you mentioned here. What would it be? Like, it doesn't have to be a battery metal, too. Like, you can take copper, or uranium, but what, what would it be? Uh, for us, it's uranium. Okay. Yeah, that that's where we see the the largest potential and also the let's say the least downside potential. Mm. But there's a billion pounds of uranium out there. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> no, the only true. thing we see is is that that now people are really coming back to nuclear um, energy. The whole landscape, uh, the perception of nuclear energy has completely changed the last twelve months. Um, secondary supply is not as big as it was, of course, because a lot of things have been sold down the last 10 years. The uranium price of the Fukushima went in, into a really prolonged bear market. And now we got a lot of also financial vehicles picking up pounds. We're getting a lot of investor interests. We're getting a lot of counters now adding or 
starting building up uh, nuclear energy. So I guess this trend uh, will put quite some 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 tailwinds to mm. it. I noticed that a lot of these questions that I ask you, like those are things that you've already thought about yourself and you've researched. Do you, how do you, who, who maybe, who do you follow for a uh, researcher in the market? Is it like, like is, is there somebody, um, you know, it seems like the battery metal space is like a rather obscure space and a lot of the people tweeting about it, they have some type of a secret cryptic language that I, I usually don't understand. But so, who do who do you guys follow? Do you, do you read any newsletters or any any Twitter profiles or something that I could check? Well, I think we don't have to mention to you the uranium names, right? You have a, a pretty good coverage on those guys already on your show. Um, we actually don't have very specific names, to be honest. It's it's really kind of a a, a broader holistic approach how we look at things. We don't have this this one guru that answers all the questions to us. That seems like a good approach there. You know, diversify your your sources too. Yeah. 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 What what I what I learned in my life is the the broader you look at, at issues or problems or questions, the the dangles make much more sense, right? Or don't make sense, right? You can much better challenge uh, you know, statements from somebody if, if you have different angles to approach the same question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with that. So that's not always what people um, want to see, especially on the internet. Um, <laughs> I would invite everybody on whatever thesis they have, because just I want to have that, you know, question yeah. that I jokingly said, but there's a billion pounds out there, because that's an actual argument that people have made. And, um, and, uh, and there's that. Yes. But, yeah. you, but you also, since you mentioned the program for battery metals in the US, right? Mm -hmm. There's also this program, as you know, for the strategic reserve and everything in the US. Mm -hmm. And and now we are in maybe a year into this program and you see how the US producers struggle to bring up production, right? Mm. They, they, there's not much in the short term, especially if you look at the, at the big picture, right? So everything, all this... I invested in the in the last big bull market in commodities in the early 2000s and and what you really see is now how much more difficult it got to permit something in in the space you mm -hmm. know there was the idea you can do it in a couple of years let's say less than 10 years now you are looking at so many different issues going from uh, you know the the migration routes of deers or animals to to habitats and of 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 a small frog that is basically killing a mine, you know. Mm. So, so, so therefore, the whole thing got much more unpredictable, right? Unpredictable is a yeah, it's a very kind, kind way of putting it, especially when everything uh, is, is is bifurcated, as they call it, um, and politically too, everything yes. is divided. So I mean, this this is the big thing as well, right? If you look at the uranium market, if if Kazakhstan goes down for whatever reason, because it's just in the middle between China and Russia, uh, you have a huge impact on that market, right? And and you see now how the the North Americans are struggling to trying to diversify away their sourcing from material from Kazakhstan. Mm. Yeah, a little bit too late. Um, yes, little, but, on the late side. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's on the late side, right? But that's what Simon also mentioned as well, right? If you look at the baseball analogy where we are standing in which inning, um, as you know, right, the Europeans only realized that we are maybe too reliant on Russian gas probably a couple of months ago, right? Sure. But the thing was always there, right? Germany importing so much gas from just one single source as an industry nation probably wasn't the best idea right absolutely right i mean you if you think about diversifying your um information sources how 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 doesn't a, a country think about diversifying its energy sources especially if you're still an intense uh, user of energy yes mm. yeah and absolutely that... i mean germany is an industrial country you're very very good point yeah yeah 
and and I mean the same with you know what is the solution to the energy, um, you know problem. I mean we see solar is an is an option, wind is an option. I I would heavily recommend to think about it as a diversified approach, because if something doesn't go falls down for whatever reason, then you're back stuck again in a in a huge issue, right? Mm. So, so I wouldn't say nuclear is the only solution, or I wouldn't say solar is the only solution. It, I think it it really needs. A, if you want to have a reliable sourcing of energy, you need a proper mix of of various sources that you you don't fall flat on the nose if just one goes down, right? Because it's your majority source. Yeah, I guess that's um, as that's a prudent way to to go about it. At, you know the the way of diversification. So that does make sense to me. Matthias and Simon, thank you both for covering this. Uh, I'll add some of these um, some of these things here to my list of things to look into. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I'll call you up next time as I want to know more. As for now, w- was there something that you came here hoping to talk about but I failed to bring up? No, I would say as a, as a first session, it was very good covering a broader range of topics, right? And then we can see what what warrants a deeper look at it, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. And since but you it... mentioned Bitcoin mining, actually, Simon and I met at the at the crypto company, one of the most successful in Switzerland. So okay. that's how we got to know each other. So do you, are you guys, I mean, you don't see that often, you know, uh, mining people being in, in crypto. Are you guys in crypto too? Yes, yeah. we, st- we still are, yeah. It's actually our first podcast we did with Jamie Keach. You find that on the internet. It was okay. actually transitioning from crypto to mining because usually, as you know, the, the way is opposite around, right? Yeah. Everybody's leaving mining and, and the young generation is actually not even entering the traditional mining. They, they straight go to crypto. Mm-hmm. And there's I a agree guy in Zurich that organizes these launches and, and we, we are, let's say, in the early 40s and we are probably the youngest guys in the room on these mining launches. Hmm. There's probably one or two guys usually out of 80 that are younger than us and everybody else is, is 60 plus, you know. It's true, yeah. Oh, last time I was, I was one of those guys. Like I felt completely out of place. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, not because of the age thing, but just because yeah. like everybody just has a different vibe to them. Like you can see, they're much more experienced. They know much more. They're uh, everybody obviously has a lot more money than me, so they're dressed differently. Even and they, just, they just behave in a different way. And then mm-hmm. um, you, you can totally see that. I, I think I was the youngest guy uh, in Zurich on the on that conference. On the conference, yeah, you probably were actually. Yeah, I. I mean, Scott from Snowline is also at the younger end. Yeah, he's like 35. Exactly, yeah. But he's he's the young upcoming CEO, right, in the industry. <laughs> he, he's, yeah, the funny thing about him, I, I interviewed him too, but the funny thing about him yeah. is that he's, um, at 35, he, he's got 30 years of experience. Yeah, so. <laughs> just kicking rocks with his father, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah he's, he's the, the hidden... <laughs> The hidden, how do you say, yeah. the hidden guy that actually has a lot of experience but doesn't look like right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I had I had also a call with the with the guy that took over from an older guy. I think the the new CEO of I think it's Euro Energy, and and he's kind of the young guy, and but he's like fifty, you know, in Uranium, the young CEO. And he's been in the company for twenty years. Something. Yeah, exactly. He told me I'm here like forever, you know, half of my life. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's great. I like John a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. John Cash. Is his name exactly. Is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you both for investing your time with me. Mm-hmm. Thank, Thank you, Antonio, for Thank the opportunity. You. Thank you for having us.